Hey, I'm standing in front of a field of sunflowers. You may be just listening to this, but I hope you get to see it. And I'm doing that for a reason. We're launching into uh, a kind of a study with a man named Paul Tournier, a remarkable person devoted to human growth and flourishing. He was a Swiss physician who was so captivated by how God works in human lives and such a student of human beings that people would just tell him what was going on in their deepest souls. And he became really kind of the earliest guy to try to integrate the truth of Scripture and Bible and theology and spirituality with psychology uh, so that people could grow. And that's why I'm here in front of these sunflowers. They just got planted not too long ago. There's a person in my life who's very dear to me that loves sunflowers above all other flowers. So we used to have lots of them around. And one of the remarkable things about a sunflower is its love for the light, is its love for the sun. You might think that plants can't move. I usually think of them that way, but you would be wrong. Uh, sunflower in its early days is what's called a heliotrope, heliosis, from the Greek word for sun. And it is created by God so that it turns to receive maximum light. And in fact, it is uh, able to be four times more prolific, flourishing uh, when it is facing the light warmer than when it is not. So when the little sunflower wakes up in the morning, it's facing the east. It is facing where the sun's going to come. And then God made it so that it actually grows faster during the day on the eastern stem than the western stem, so that as the sun is going by, the sunflower is able to actually turn to be receiving maximum light, maximum life, maximum goodness from the sun. And then, amazingly enough, during the night, the western side of the stem grows more so that the sunflower turns back. And when the dawn comes, it's facing the sun, ready for more light, ready for more life. And that is a beautiful picture of the way that you and I are invited to live life. All through the Bible, one of the most common images for God is that God is light. John says in his letter, 1 John, in verse 5, In him is life, uh, in him is light, and there is no darkness at all. God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. And in the Gospel of John, um, Jesus is described in this way. In him was life, and that life was the light of all humanity. The light was coming into the world, the light that gives life. The light has come into the darkness, and the darkness cannot put it out. So now the invitation for you and me today is to be a little heliotrope, to just turn towards the light. And the way that we do that is in our minds. In any moment, my mind can get pulled into the darkness of temptation or the darkness of inadequacy or the darkness of resentment. And then I remember my friend Jesus is here and I was made to be turned towards him. One of the words in the Bible for convert, to convert is to turn. So all day we are turning. There's an old, wonderful shaker hymn. It was not much known until Aaron Copeland, uh, Aaron Copeland composed Appalachian Spring and used this particular song. Shakers were a branch of the Quakers. They were given to very exuberant and uh, high movement worship. That's why they were called the Shaker Quakers. I'm not making that up. And they were egalitarian, so there were women that led with them from the very beginning. They were pacifists. They would not engage in violence. But one of their wonderful hymns says, it's a gift to be simple. It's a gift to be free. It's a gift to come out where we ought to be. And when we come to the place that's right, we find ourselves in the valley of love and delight. When true simplicity is gained, to bend and to bow, to serve and to worship, we shan't be ashamed. To turn, turn, will be our delight, till by turning, turning, we come out right. And we need that because, as Jesus also said in the Gospel of John, part of the difficulty is that although this light has come into the world, we prefer darkness. 
And so always there's that question, will I step into the light when my thoughts or actions or temptations want me to be hidden and separate from God? I was with a good friend of mine this week and he was telling me about his grandparents. His grandfather, he said, could be just kind of an ass with his grandmother. He's kind of a nasty guy, always had to be right. They were having an argument one time about whether they had just driven past a pheasant or a chicken hawk. And he was so determined to be right, they made a bet. He bet a dollar, and so she bet a silver dollar uh, about which one they thought it was. He turned the car around and went back and showed her he was right, and he got that silver dollar, and he kept it, and he put it in his pocket. And every time they would get in an argument, he would pull it out and just remind her, I am the one who is right. And he did that for many, many, many years until he met Jesus. And he realized that he had been treating his wife uh, out of a heart of darkness and he wanted to turn to the light. And so he gave my friend Steve that silver dollar and told him the story and said, I'm not carrying anymore the need to show that I am right. And Steve has carried it for many years and he has already selected a grandson to whom he will give it. I prefer the darkness when I would rather do what is wrong. I was taking a shower the other day and it was quite a while before I got into it. And Nancy just yelled drought because there's a drought going on. It's hard for things like sunflowers to grow and water was wasting. But internally, my response was not, yes, I care about God's creation. I want to be somebody who stewards it well. My internal response was, well, who died and made you the queen of water? And I just got defensive. And so I took a shower and this is something I've struggled with my whole life. Afterward, I was just a little bit more distant and a little bit more quiet. And then the next morning when I was reflecting, turn, 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 I had the thought, I need to tell this to Nance because it would be a good thing for her to know about me. It would be a good thing to apologize for. It would make me less likely to do it again in the future. But I did not want to bring it into the light. And so I struggled with that internally until that question came, why wouldn't I want to bring it into light? What, what do I care? I am no more mature than I actually am. It's good for somebody that I know and love to know the truth about me. It's, it's, there's a human, to bend and to bow, we shan't be ashamed. So I just brought it into light. Here's what Paul Tournier writes about uh, how a person that he has been talking to, working with for weeks, even months on end, in utter darkness, when suddenly a light shines, not from us, to illumine that life. The living God has been breaking in upon that person, rousing into activity the guiding force that will suddenly manifest itself. And then he gives this analogy. He says, and this is from his book, The Meaning of Persons, that we're going to be looking at. He says, our life is a score composed by God. The person, you or I, is the conductor who is assuring its performance by directing the orchestra, our body, our mind, what God has given to us, gift to be simple, gift to be free. It's a gift. But the composer is not absent. He is there during the performance. He leans over to the conductor and encourages him. He whispers in his ear, making clear his intentions and helping him to put them into execution. And it's by listening to that voice that we turn, turn, turn to the light. I was thinking when I read this from Tournier, there's a story about a great, I think he was a Polish pianist, Paderewski. I don't know if it's true or one of those kind of urban myths, but there was a concert going on and everybody was waiting for the maestro and some little kid snuck up on the stage and started playing chopsticks on the uh, Steinway Grand Piano, and of course everybody in the hall is disgusted and um, appalled and wonder why couldn't the parents keep an eye on this kid and who let this happen. And Paderewski is in the wings and he hears what's going on. And so instead of yelling, he rushes out there and puts those two great big arms around the little arms of that tiny little child. And he begins to improvise this magnificent composition right on the spot two chopsticks. And while he's doing that, he leans down and whispers into the ear of that little child, just keep going, just keep playing, just don't stop, just don't quit. You and I will do this together. 
And of course, of all the things that he played that night, so the story goes, the one that became the most unforgettable piece of artistry and genius and magic and beauty was the one that got improvised around the hands of a little child. And so, Paul Tournier says, the composer is not absent. In our messed up, um, inadequate, weak, often darkness-filled little lives, he bends down over us in his grace and he whispers into our ears, you keep going today. You don't stop today. You keep on playing because I'm at work with you. I'm the one that's making the music. And so we turn to the light all through the day. You turn to the light when darkness comes, when you're afraid, when you might feel depressed about something, when you're aware that you're inadequate, when you are tempted to do the wrong thing, when you mistreat somebody, when somebody mistreats you, we turn, turn, turn to the light. We are heliotropic beings and the light has come into the darkness and the darkness cannot put it out. We turn. We're on this great adventure together. I'll see you next time. Thanks for joining us here at becomenew.me. My name's Tim and I'm a part of the team. You can join the conversation on YouTube or Facebook or Instagram. If you'd like to receive the daily emails that go along with each video, let us know at becomenew.me at gmail.com. Or if you want prayer, you can text us at 855-888-0444. We'll see you next time.